Hello, and thank you for downloading the Witness History podcast from the BBC World Service. We're taking you back to Iran in 1975 and the appointment of the first ever Minister of Women's Affairs, Manaz Afghami. She spoke to Farhana Haider in 2018. It was a very cold, snowy day. I was presented by the Prime Minister to the King at the airport during the departure ceremonies for a head of state who was leaving. It was both an unusual setting and an unusual appointment. Manaz was asked to become Minister for Women under Iran's King, the Shah. Since the late 1960s, women had been making progress in Iran, They'd entered the diplomatic corps, the judiciary and the police force. Manaz, who was born in Iran but had studied in the US, had returned to teach literature at the National University. Together with her students, she founded the Association of University Women and in 1970 became the Secretary General of the Women's Organization of Iran. In the 70s, the country was very modern. We had a lot of history of activism in Iran. When I was the Secretary General of the Women's Organization, groups of us traveled to countries such as China, the Soviet Union, Iraq, India, to see how women in other countries lived. And we had had Germaine Greer, the radical Australian and British feminist in Iran, to speak to women. And there was a huge amount of change and activism. 19 1975 was labelled the International Year of the Woman by the United Nations. Manaz thinks that this might have provided part of the inspiration for the creation of the post. And as the role had never existed before, it gave her great freedom to do as she wanted. You were the only woman in the Iranian government. What was that like? It was a very interesting experience. There were 20 men and I was the only woman. I was very young, but I learned that you cannot make suddenly feminists out of 20 men. In order to change it, you have to come to terms with the negotiations. And I learned that they were just as worried as I was. We had to sort of learn how to deal with this. For instance, you see, when I had meetings, the person who would bring a file to the meeting would look to see who's the oldest man in the meeting to give it to. They never thought that I could be leading a meeting. When my car was driven to the prime ministry, for instance, the policeman at the door who always saluted the ministers didn't know what to do, whether he was supposed to salute a woman. So he just put his hand up and sort of like a pretzel turned himself every which way. Every aspect of the role was new and unfamiliar both to me and to others. How much power did you have in that role? It just so happened a huge amount of power. The very fact that I was new and the role was new, nobody knew what it was supposed to be. So we could say things and people would have a difficult time to refute it because they thought, well, maybe this is what a woman's affairs person should really do. And that was, for instance, we suggested that there should be coordination between various government ministries, education, health, agriculture, labor, everything, with a focus on how their programs impacted the role of women. And that's how we got, for instance, we were able to pass the idea that childcare on the premises was indispensable for working women, that maternity leave up to seven months paid with full benefits was a right of a woman. We were able to have flexible hours for women up to age of three of their child. So these were the possibilities that came about, as well as reform of the family laws. So as Women's Affairs Minister, you could have influence on every legislation that was passed. We suggested that since women were half of the population, whatever bill had to come through the government to go to the majlis or the parliament, we should look at it in terms of impact on women's role. By 1978, Iranian women had gained equal rights to divorce. All labor laws and regulations were revised to eliminate sex discrimination and incorporate equal pay for equal work. At about this time, the U.S. president also visited Iran. On New Year's Eve 1977, that uh, President Carter came there, and I was one of his hosts. Iran, because of the great leadership of the Shah, is an island of stability 
in one of the more troubled areas of the world. But he was wrong. In Iran, there was growing resentment towards the rule of the Shah, an anti-American sentiment by both religious and secular groups who wanted social and economic change. And in November 1978, while she was in New York for work, Manaz received a phone call from her husband that changed her life. My husband said that he had had a phone call from the Queen who asked where I was and he had said that I'm in New York but I'll be coming back. And she had said, well, perhaps she should stay and not come back right now. And then, of course, prior to that, I had had news from Iran that the centers of the women's organization were being attacked. Then he said that, you know, it's extremely dangerous and it's better for you not to come back. So this began my exile. And there was such a cataclysmic change in such a short while. In February 1979, the Shah was overthrown. Many were excited, believing that this would lead to a freer, more modern Iran. But as the revolution continued, it became clear that the Islamic religious radicals were taking control. For Manaz, as a member of the Iranian government, it was dangerous for her to return. And this became even more evident when the only other woman who had ever served in an Iranian cabinet Farouk Rupasa was executed. She was a mentor for me and a, and a very dedicated woman. The charge against her was the same that was against me, corruption on earth and warring with God. She was uh, called a prostitute and she was hung in the red light district in Tehran. So I have no doubt that if I'd been there, I would have been the subject of the same. I have this survivor's guilt thinking that if I had been there, perhaps she would have been saved. After the revolution, the status of women changed substantially. The visibility of women became one of the main points of contention for the fundamentalists. Yesterday's demonstration was the nearest thing to an anti-Khomeini rally yet. The imposition of Islamic law here has started with an order to women to cover their heads in government offices. Many are furious. Only a minority in Tehran already follow the instruction. You'd made so much progress, Menaz, in your role as the women's minister. And what did the revolution do to all of that? Well, it actually destroyed the accomplishments of women, all the laws having to do with family. This was the very first dictate that Khomeini gave when he came to power was to negate the family law. Then the next one was segregation of men and women. In fact, what Khomeini wanted and the execution of Mrs. Parsa also indicated that more clearly to us that women would be really pushed back to 100 years. Despite the legislative progress and freedoms that have been lost, Manaz remains positive about the role of women in Iran. The Iranian women, if anything, they have become more active, more involved and more politically astute. So to see that all the work of all the women, including the generation of Mrs. Parsa, has not gone to waste. If ever we have a democratic system, these women would be at the forefront of it. Younger generation, the more connected generation, are really thirsty both to know their own past, but also what of it they can pick up and carry forward. I think if change comes to Iran, which it has to, then it will have to be led by women. Manaz Afghami was speaking to Farhana Haida in 2018. She continues to fight for women's rights and has written a memoir called The Other Side of Silence. And there's a collection of programmes on the history of Iran on our website. That's bbcworldservice.com forward slash witness history.